from the Center for the Study and Teaching of Writing at The Ohio State University. This is Writer's Talk. I'm Doug Dangler. Today, OSU student Patrick Patiandi talks to OSU researcher Alice Conklin for our latest segment of Writer's Talk History. Our guest today is Dr. Alice Conklin, associate professor at OSU, specializing in the history of France, imperialism, and the social sciences. She is the author of A Mission to Civilize, The Republican Idea of Empire in France and West Africa, 1895 to 1930. Her new book is scheduled for release in 2013, is titled In the Museum of Man, Anthropology, Racial Science, and Humanism in France and its Empire, 1850 to 1950. We're speaking with Professor Conklin about her recent article for Origins, Socialism Takes Over France Again. Thanks for being on the show, Professor Conklin, and welcome. Thank you for having me. Many well-known periodicals expressed alarm at the election of a socialist president in France. But you argue for a sense of historical perspective when it comes to evaluating the election. What does France's history after World War II reveal about Francois Hollande's election? Well, France's history since World War II has been perhaps can think of it as being broken up into two large periods, what they call the 30 glorious years of economic growth and rebuilding, and then a period that we may still be in of 30 inglorious years triggered by the first OPEC oil crisis, really a a dramatic restructuring of the economy and all the pain that that has involved. So at the moment of liberation in France in 1946, there was a real commitment on the part of people who'd been in the resistance as well, interestingly enough, people on the right, not necessarily involved with the collaborationist Vichy regime, which is one of France's great shames during World War II. Both groups were in entire agreement, center-right, and all those who'd been part of the resistance led by Charles de Gaulle, that France had to rebuild and had to provide a new deal for all its citizens, which meant the creation of a very generous welfare state. And the fact that there was a consensus around this welfare state, I think, helps, if you want to take the really long view, explain why in the last election, the socialists who are very committed to keeping that welfare state, along with really many people on the center right still in France, were able to or chose to elect François Hollande because the incumbent, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, was seen as having moved too close to the kind of German position, which is embracing austerity, cutting back public spending, and therefore jeopardizing what is seen as a commitment on the part of the state to provide all citizens with a minimum of security. And you mentioned the Vichy regime in your answer, and I'm wondering what effect did the rise of fascism have on France's socialists? Well, in the 30s, the socialists were famously divided. Really, it goes back much further than that. The divisions on the left, the rise of fascism caused, for the first time, a coalition of communists, socialists, and what were then known as radicals, a kind of centrist Republicans, in the French sense, centrist Democrats, to come together for the first time and create a popular front that argued for the need to defend democracy against fascism. And it was in no way a a socialist program. It was a defend democracy program, and they were swept into power in in 1936. Unfortunately, France was still in a lingering depression, and the the vision they had for, for bringing more social justice to the French along with fighting fascism uh, foundered on the shoals of of economic crisis. So they they were in power only two years. Sounds like they didn't quite get a lot of the credit for fighting the Nazis during World War II, or or were they able to build on that politically in kind of the wake of World War II? Well, the collapse of the Popular Front left socialists very disillusioned. When World War II came along and France collapsed, the most of the socialist deputies in parliament were part of the group that that voted against giving powers to General Pétain, who then became this collaborator with the, with the Nazi occupier. So the socialists actually have a good record in World War II. The communists have the best record because they, after 41, uh, massively move into the resistance. And it's the coalition, once again, of, of communists and socialists that help explain why the welfare state is is pushed through with also the Gaullists 
and the those on the center right who also joined the resistance. So the resistance can't be described as a predominantly socialist or leftist movement. I think that's really important to your argument, perhaps, in saying the the that many in France support the kind of establishment of a kind of broad based welfare state. Is that correct? That's correct. I would just add that for the center right, it was not necessarily a social justice argument that led them to embrace a welfare state. It was a argument about France had an anemic birth rate. It was a kind of backwards, stalled country all the way through to the 1930s. And for France to rebuild and to become modern and take its place once again as a world power after the humiliating defeat of World War II, that you needed a very strong pro-family, pro-natalist, that is to say a, a state that protected every life, every child's life. And that is a distinctive also trait of the French welfare system, that it is very family-friendly, family-oriented. You get a lot of money for each additional child that you have, all things that the, the French have come to value very much. And you point out in your article that France's middle class, rather than the working class, eventually became the primary constituency of the Socialist Party, which is perhaps surprising. How or why did this happen? The French working class in the 30 glorious years of rebuilding France's economy after World War II were almost overwhelmingly communist. They voted, the Communist Party gets 25% of the vote almost regularly from the 19, late 1940s through uh, into the early 1970s. So one reason the socialists become the party of the uh, largely of the middle class is that there is an alternative further to the left for the working class. The other um, explanation for the middle class base of the Socialist Party, particularly since the 70s, is that the working class as we know it historically, the, the blue collar working class has disappeared as it has in gradually as it has in, in America in a post-industrial society and that those people who've been laid off or had difficult trans, a difficult time transitioning into, into the, the service sector economy have gravitated, unfortunately, to the far right, to the national front. So that is um, one of the unhappy developments of the last 30 years in France, a kind of resurgence of a, of a neo-fascist movement. Is that sort of uh, kind of movement to the right, is that kind of a similar, is that tied up with sentiments of kind of anti-immigration that you kind of maybe see in places like Britain as well? Precisely. Part of the appeal of the far right is that the National Front movement of Jean-Marie Le Pen, and now it's his daughter who's heading it up, is that they have a very strong anti-immigrant discourse, which blames the lack of jobs or the sense of unease uh, on on so-called immigrants, that is to say, people who don't necessarily look and act like <laughs> Jean-Marie Le Pen himself, um, people who usually are French but are still called immigrants because he's talking about second-generation workers who've come in from North Africa, former colonies often. And before we switch gears into kind of other topics, I'm wondering if there's anything else uh, related to the election of the socialist president Hollande in France, if that you think maybe the greater news media has missed in relation to, to his election? Well, I think the news media, by definition, isn't interested in long-term origins, the things that I've been talking about. Certainly, what, what we haven't talked about are the immediate reasons for Hollande's elections, and most of the media were most interested in those immediate reasons. Sarkozy comes to power, the the previous president, and immediately you hit. He runs into the 2008 global crisis. His response to that is, as I said, to embrace austerity, to move closer to Angela Merkel. All of this played out very poorly in France, and so Hollande benefited enormously from the unpopularity, the lack of popularity of Nicolas Sarkozy and. That's what the, the media would have focused on, and rightly so, but they would have missed this, I think, the underlying reason for what the French electorate would like now from François Hollande, which is a more humane way of addressing what has to be a cut, uh, a scaling back of public spending. 
Um, and your article for Origins, Socialism Takes Over France Again, is a digital media piece of writing geared toward a popular audience. Is there some advantage to this form of writing over what historians have traditionally done? There surely is, though I wrote my piece very much as I would have written a lecture for my undergraduate survey course on France. To me, it's not so much that the writing is different, but that you have a chance to reach a much broader audience through distribution over the Internet, and especially abroad. Um, where I think there is there are peop- there are so many people who for whom the internet is a wonderful sort of library that virtual library or vir- that they don't have access to otherwise. I think that's very interesting. You've almost headed off my my second follow up question. I'm wondering if you know there's something that kind of that formal traditional academic style of writing has to offer that maybe is lost a bit in the translation to kind of a more popular form. But it sounds like your you're kind of arguing that there's a blend of the two and that the two kind of work well together or can work well together. I think they can. I think that historians, by definition, tell stories, and that's a wonderful narrative strategy for communicating any kind of information. At the same time, they build an analysis, which helps, I think, people who are curious about why things happen the way they do respond to hearing a historian tell his or her particular story about an event. Um, I'm wondering what made you pursue a career as a historian? Um, There are many, perhaps, layers to that answer. In particular, I would bring up the fact that I had the advantage of learning French very young because my family lived abroad. And so when we came back, I was 10, and I pursued my education. I was doing all this French literature because that's what you did when you studied French. And then when I went to college, I had the good fortune to be in a school where there were two French historians. And as soon as I started doing history, I had no interest in doing literature anymore. I think it was just the, the, I have a very um, analytical mind and I was always interested in the why and To me, that is what history has always been, explaining why things happen, first discovering that they did happen, and then trying to to unravel why they happened. And on top of learning French at a young age, is there something about the kind of public culture around history or the humanities of France, of valuing that sort of culture in France that drew you to the history of France in particular? I think that appreciation of that came later. What I often like to say, I've been a, I began my career as a historian as someone who studies colonialism, and because I went to a French school very young, I like to think that I was actually civilized or colonized by the French without even realizing it, and therefore um, it's not surprising that my my intellectual and professional trajectory took me into the heart of a country that values culture and is willing to export it and to, and to encourage people to become part of that culture from the outside. And lastly, what made you choose to write for a publication like Origins? Well, to be perfectly honest, it was my colleague who asked me to do so. And I said, sure, that seems like a great opportunity to do the kind of public outreach that, especially in a big public university, is part of our responsibility and our vocation. I think that's perfectly put. So, well, Professor Conklin, thank you very much for joining us today on Writers Talk History. Thank you, Patrick. I've enjoyed being here. For more Writers Talk, visit www.writerstalk.org. Writers Talk.org. Writers Talk.